We are back. It's a Monday. I'm Paul John Dykes. This is Amy Canavan, and we are on the Axon Bulletin. It's episode something like 1,100, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, Amy, loads to discuss. Yes, it is the pre-season, but uh, there's plenty happening in the world of Celtic, and we're going to run through most of that. I've got the um, the tagline, why would Celtic sell Juranovic when we're guaranteed the Champions League riches? The reason I've used that again is because this seems to be swinging from there's interest, Celtic are going to sell, no they're not. Um, and, you know, some of that interest is conflicted even with the source. For, so, for example, we've had a Sky Sports source saying yes and a Sky Sports source saying no. Um, where are we with Juranovic and do you agree with my sentiments that actually this guy should be going nowhere? We don't need, even if someone bids 20 million, Amy, we don't need that kind of money at the moment. No, we don't need to sell him. It's going to be down to the player, isn't it? You know, I think the latest actual club names, Atletico Madrid, you know, it's a huge name in Europe. And it, uh, it is tricky to, to try and compete with the, the absolute elite. I think, if I'll be honest, if it was uh, probably 16 out of the 20 Premier League sides down south, I'd be like, absolutely no chance. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there is there is a pool of Atletico Madrid they are expected to reach the last eight, last four of the Champions League, if not further, year in, year out, the money that they can spend. So I think it simply will just come down to the player because, no, there's no need for Celtic to, to, to sell anyone, to be honest. Um, and there's certainly no need to, to sell Juranovic at all. Um, I think, you know, I think he said before, he, he's happy. I've got no doubts about that. Even if he leaves, I'd still say that he is happy. Um, but I think, you know, the, the money... Celtic cannot compete with the money that he will make then at, 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 at Atletico, sorry. It's also a lot warmer. Um, but I, it's it is simply going to be down to him. You know, he is an unbelievable talent and there's no surprise that the Atleticos of, of Europe are already coming in for him because he can play at the very top. You know, I think the the international appearances as well, especially against France, that's just going to have ramped any kind of, in, any previous interest up even more. Um, and certainly I've caught the eye of um, the elite in Europe. So I don't want Celtic to sell them, obviously, um, but I think it will seriously just be down to the player. And if it is, I would still, I know you said 20, I would be going 25. I really would be. I think he's a, an exceptional talent. If the you think he's up there with Bassey? You actually think that? Wow, I know. It's a bold <laughs> claim from myself, I know. Um, but I think, you know, if if Europe's elite want to come call on, then they've got to um, spend the big bucks. 100%. 100%. There's a few things that I'm taking from it, though. Um, just as a share, I'm not being rude, I'm sharing the uh, links on all the various platforms because we are now exclusively going live on YouTube. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. And I'm being that rude guy in the corner that's on his phone whilst we're having a discussion. Apologies. I'm almost done. A few things I would take from all of this. First thing, we picked this fella up for £2.7 million pounds last season. Um, and I've said before... And I'll continue to say it. my focus is always on Celtic. So when often when we are linked to players outside of that bubble, Amy, like a lot of people, I need to go and dig in and see who is the, the person. I don't have that knowledge of Polish football or Japanese football um, as a lot of other people do or apparently do or with hindsight do. So I then go and find out as much as I can about the player. But I think when he signed, it was, OK, he's an international player. We remember the Arthur Boric farewell, etc. Um, but we kind of plucked him, I felt, for £2.7 million, And it was a signing at the time. I'm going to say it was kind of low-key. It wasn't like, you know, I remember the Kyogo signing four and a half million quid and there was a huge amount of a flurry of activity around about that particular buy. But what I think that says to us is, again, it rubber stamps just how tremendous the recruitment's been since Ange's come in, that he's being linked with or there is interest from Premiership clubs, Atletico Madrid, um, etc. But at the same time, I'm going to throw this out here and I know that we're in a world of positivity and I'm not going to um, change that in any way, shape or form, um, even though I will be mentioning comedian Ross Mainz's video at some point during today. Um, the positive thing, I love that and I don't want to ruin it, but I think this is a real test of the board's metal as well as the player. I mean, the player is contracted for another uh, few seasons and um, so obviously we're in control of that. But again, that goes in, that flies in the face of only keeping players who want to play for Celtic, which has always been my mantra. 
and it's been my mantra since guys like uh, Collins left and and Van Hooydonk left, the guys that you know you just wanted to see them develop in, in a Celtic jersey, but they didn't want to be here, and you feel kind of like um, kind of let down by that. And uh, but then over time you realise that okay, footballers are mercenary. They do want to basically just use Celtic as a platform or a stepping stone. Um, but even then, it's too soon for me, if you if you ask me, in, in relation to Zhiranovic. I think it's a test of the board's metal. Um, people will say to me, Lennon's last season, if there was ever um, an example of why not to keep players who don't want to be at the club, that is it. Absolutely. But it is a, it's a debate to be had. It's a discussion to be had. Um, if a big bid comes in, I say 20, you say 25, it'll be in that ballpark. If that happens... Um, is it a test of the board's metal? Because we don't need the money. And I know that sounds quite shallow from my perspective in a um, you know, a global kind of catastrophic financial crisis that we don't need 20 million quid. Who would who would not back 20 million pounds? But in the terms of football, in the bubble of football, Amy, Celtic don't need that money. So why would we sell? It's all down to keeping the team happy, keeping the morale happy, not having that bad egg. And I'm not going to say Zhiranovic would become a bad egg, but you want everybody to be happy in the dressing room. Yeah, and I, and I agree it will be, to a degree, a test of, of the board's metal. But I think more than ever, um, you know, the power of the player and the power of the player's agents, larger than ever. Um, and I don't know how much the board can actually compete with that nowadays. And I don't even just mean Celtic's board. I mean, you know, any board. Uh, the, the power of the player is huge. Um, you're, you're spot on. And it sounds like you say, like, we wouldn't take 20, 25 million in a, in a heartbeat. But Celtic don't need it. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the, the conflicting part as well that I touched on earlier, that, you know, he does seem happy. Juranovic looks smart in the training gear as well. Um, noted. But I, it's um, he does always appear happy. And I get what you mean with the... It seems too soon as well, because I agree, cause he's not even got really a full season under his belt. You know, spent a lot of time on the sidelines. Um, I don't actually know. I don't have his numbers of the season to hand um, from last. But, you know, the reason that we're all talking about Tony Ralston still is because it shows you how many games he did still play. And then, obviously, there were times that Juranovic was, was uh, chucked out on the left. But, you know, he's not had that full set season at Celtic. It has been very stop-start with, with mm. injuries. So, um, th- there is still so much more to give. And the ball, I don't know... I don't know who's caught the balls and I think it's always I, I hate to say it, I really do, but I just think you see it so often now that it is so much always in the in the players' court. Um the club can say no um and whatnot, but that I keep going back to that that power of the player it is frightening and it's not the way that it should be and, and I really do disagree with it. Um but you know they, they do kind of seem to get the, the final say these days. Um in comparison, like you're going back to Collins and Van Hoydoink, um the the the, the pendulum has swung uh, in, in favour of the, the player more and more now. I always say this, um, maybe it's because I'm ancient, Amy, but it's not a new phenomenon at Celtic. Um, I think, if I say we've always been a selling club, what I'm talking about is if you go back to the 50s, <laughs> I wasn't around then, Um Although Colin Watt thought I was. I think he thought I watched Jimmy McGrory playing. But if you go back to the 50s, guys like Willie Fernie were, were sold for big money, um, as was uh, Bobby Collins. You go into the 1960s and, uh, you know, that continued with Paddy Crerin. I think the only time it kind of stopped was when the Lions were at their prime. Jock Steen was allowed to actually keep that team together. Um, none of the Lisbon Lions left for big transfers. You know, um, quite a few of them ended up getting free transfers. And uh, in the in the case of the likes of Billy McNeil, one club man, Bobby Lennox, played right through to 1980, astonishingly. But then you move into the Quality Street kids. We'd sold all the best of them, other than Danny McGrain. Uh, Conley left for other reasons. And then, you know, moving into the 1980s with the likes of Brian McClare leaving the club and, you know, the, Charlie Nicholas, of course, before him, the 90s was your Collins and Van Hunt. And then it's continued. We've always been that kind of selling club, which um, I, I understand that sometimes it's necessary. But I think what I've been trying to put the message across over the last few weeks is we're in a position where it really isn't necessary right now. Um, and I would love to see that development of this Celtic side, you know, with Ange Postacoglu for three or four years, I really would. And I feel that we had that discussion, then your big man, Fabrizio Romano, 
uh, on the same day comes in and almost pulls the rug from under our feet. Then I felt as though we'd been proved right by saying that we're not selling anybody. And then somebody else comes in and says, oh, well, actually, I let it go, Madrid are interested. We will continue to uh, report on that particular story as it develops, as we always do on a Celtic state of mind. Magnet67, welcome. You're watching on YouTube. For anyone who is watching, get your comments and let us know what you think about the topical discussions that we're having today. Um, I've also got a couple of clips that I think you might, int might interest you or amuse you. Um, depending on your, your humour. Magnet67, afternoon Axon team. At the end of the day, if he wants to leave, the club will seek the highest offer they can. He has four years left in his contract and has said he is happy here. All media talk. Now, you mentioned, Amy, yes, he does appear in a video that was released this morning. Um, it dropped into our inbox. We put it out on the socials. Um, and he's wearing the, the, the training kit. But by the way, I'll go back to Christmas time when you used to get the Celtic calendar, right? And by March... Virtually half the calendar were players that no longer were at the club. That used to happen all the time. If you got to December and they were still at the club, you were doing all right. Um, but again, I also want to mention there's been a bit of negativity flying about. I'm going to get this by hook or by crook. Someone sent me a gift. Someone sent me a gift for no reason other than just being a good guy and being positive. And I think positivity, Amy, has to be welcomed on the show. So you might have seen uh, Highland Paddy on Twitter. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that you become familiar with. Yeah. Well, Highland Paddy sent me this. I don't know if you can see it properly. It's, it's Liam. Oh, there, we, Liam. there we go. Liam, there you go. Uh, nice print of Liam. And also one of this fella, the maestro. Wow. Just They're sent awesome. them into the studio just to be nice and positive. And we love all that kind of stuff. And as you can see behind us, we'll get them framed up. And we'll try and find a space on the studio I was walls. Say there's no room. You've got plenty of room in uh, your room there, I've Amy, I can see that. Exactly. I'll start taking them. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, and every wee bit of positivity is appreciated in here. Jungle Lion comes in also to say, no need to sell anyone. I totally agree with you. Absolutely agree with that. If JJ has a good Champions League and a good World Cup, Celtic will get double or even treble for him next season. You imagine that. You know, we go in and we have a good campaign in Europe this season. He goes away and performs well at the World Cup. Celtic have got to consider that. We can play the long game on this one. We don't have to cash in uh, quickly. And um, I find it really interesting. Also, there's some other comments coming in about our left-back position, which we're going to get into next. But Jerry Coyle, JJ, will leave next season after he's won the World Cup in the Champions League. Aye, Jerry, I love that. I, I was just talking about positivity, um, and Jerry has overloaded on it. But let's move on to the left-back position, where AGSE Tech is convinced... That Craig Taylor, this is a very good point. Greg Taylor will see off the challenge of young Burnaby. Uh, the list of players Taylor has seen off is long. Uh, now, before we get dug into this, there was a few comments on Friday in relation to Tony's volume. Tell me if there's any issue with the volume at this end. I've done a wee sound test, a wee sound check. Let me know if there's any issues with my volume. And if so, we'll get it sorted. Um, the left back position moving from right to left, Amy, right? Um, we're bringing in. Burnaby, uh, I, I watched with interest last week as uh, Joanna Arango uh, spoke to a couple of the Celtic platforms to give us the kind of take on the type of player that he is. 21-year-old uh, Argentinian left-back, uh, he can play left-wing back as well. 87 appearances, not a great deal of appearances for his uh, current club, Lanus. Um, yet to sign, but it looks like he's going to be the next one to sign for Celtic. Um, also interesting that uh, Mohanad Yehazi's move was discussed by the player um, who said that there was interest by Celtic and Ham Hammerby blocked the move. So that was interesting. Um, but the question is, and I guess this is what's been brought up here, he's coming in. He's not coming in as the first choice, is he? Greg Taylor's got that jersey at the moment, doesn't he? I would say so. Um, I certainly think since probably the turn of the year, I think Greg Taylor's really upped his game. Um, even more so and, and really solidified that shirt, shirt, the shirt as his own. Um, I just went through a glitch for myself. But um, no, I think he can see off um, any player really that comes in or maybe not any, but I think a, a player of Burnaby's, um, as you say, experience, lacking arguably um i just think it's only going to improve greg taylor and i think he'll you know be more than up for the challenge every single player that's came in um he's, he's managed to see them off and even with juranovic there was obviously that spell i think 
maybe gave him a little bit of kick up the backside that, you know, Ange wasn't scared to probably, well, move one of his, his most talented players, hence why we're talking about 20, 25 million pounds in a ballpark, um, over onto the left to play him out of position and, and ahead of Taylor. So, you know, he's, it's not been plain sailing for him and he's still just, I think, kept his head down and put in performance after performance, like I say, especially since post-Christmas. Um, obviously, there's been a few fleeting, not 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 anything drastically terrible, but maybe just off the, the mark a little. And he's always going to have his critics as well. And I think that's hard. I am, um, you know, he's not had the the greatest backing from the Celtic support at all times, you know, not thinking that he's up to the, the Celtic standard. But I think, you know, I know you can't always say that you just put in 110% merits you know starting week in week out you've got to have a bit of something about him I think he has got that something about him I think his end delivery can be really decent he loves to get forward I think he's really excelled under Ange especially once he really got used to the kind of system and you know how often have we seen him kind of that inverted role you know you've seen it with Ralston as well Ange Ranovich Ange really likes him to get through the middle you can always see Taylor kind of popping up there um, and you know I think even, and I know not everyone likes to, to mention it as well, I think when he played for Scotland towards the end of the season, I think some of his performances were, were pretty decent as well and that's came from the confidence of having the back and off Ange um, and you can see that he's brimming with that confidence and, and who wouldn't be within that side so I don't think he's Burnaby, going back to Burnaby, sorry, I don't think he is going to come in and walk in and just, you know, steal that number one shirt. It is going to be a bit of a competition, but as we've rightly said, that should be in every position in the park at Celtic. Um, you're always going to have a few that are definitely going to 99% of the time be first name on your team sheet, you know, Cal McGregor, um, Cameron Carter Vickers, but there's nothing wrong with a little bit of healthy competition. And I think when Greg Taylor has been faced with competition is actually when he's he's played at his best. And I think that this will only improve him and hopefully improve Burnaby as well. Yeah, I've seen a few people with concerns in relation to the physicality of both players um, yeah. and the fact that uh, we, we probably need a bit more uh, height and physicality. Um, and then after that, we then were shown footage of the supposed new left back sticking the head in somebody. And I mean, that's not the kind of physicality that we were looking for. Um, however, I think that the thing with Taylor is he's been on a bit of a journey since he signed for Celtic. I remember when he signed, there was a, a, a kind of air of resignation because we were signing him from... Uh, I'm going to say a middle of the road Scottish Premiership team. They maybe weren't at the time, actually. They were probably punching it as high away as they probably could at that time. Um, but it's taken my wee while to win over the fans. But I think it's interesting that you, you mentioned inverted fullback role. For me, it was as if uh, I think everybody had to adapt to that. And what you've got now is all the fullbacks we have, and I don't mean uh, those like Montgomery or um, Scales, who's who's been loaned out, etc. But the ones that we're talking about in terms of first team action, they've all adapted to the role. And I think there's going to be a, a period when Burnaby comes in, because it looks likely, I'm not counting my chickens, that uh, there might be a period of uh, adaptation, if you like, where, whereby he needs to get up to the speed of that particular position, whereas Taylor and Juranovic and, and uh, Ralston are already there. And they, you know, they're... Um, they've fitted into that position um, albeit it may have taken them a wee while so I think we start off with Taylor as the first choice and we've got that um, you know Barnaby who's behind them pushing them and hopefully pushing him on as well I'm going to bring up a wee uh, message here from Paddy welcome back to the show Paddy uh, will they wait for Jota to have the same outcome as they wait for how imagine I put that as the tagline my word place we're going to melt down it's a good point no and the, the, one of the reasons i bring it up is um the effect of the the whole set of circumstances around eddie howe not taking a job and postacoglu then being announced i felt um was one of the main reasons why people um reacted the way they did and i think if you go back to a lot of the reactions at the time uh, because i've been accused time and time again of um you know, writing off Ange Postacoglu and people picking up particular replies to a tweet uh, where the very nuance of that conversation is is um, plays a, ma a massive part in, in the wording of the reply. Amy, I never ever wrote off Ange Postacoglu. And I think that what you need to do is, there, there's, a, there's a great episode of Axon where it's called The Case for the Defence, where we actually sit and talk because he'd been getting a lot of flack why we need to stick with Ange as well. So it's easy for people to focus on that. But Paddy brings it up. That that disappointment was real 
100%. Um, but I'm sticking with positivity and we will come back to Jota at some point. Uh, you've mentioned the training gear that was released earlier on today. Um, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, then get yourself onto uh, some of the other content that we've got because uh, we have things like the Axon Retrospective, which um, I, over the, the kind of lockdown period, managed to track down every Celtic VHS that was ever released. VHSs, Amy, were, were at the form of videotape that you used to use back in the 80s and 90s. Do you know? Well before your time. <laughs> Well before your time, big massive chunks of plastic, <laughs> and uh, yes, we did track them all down, and we're actually going through them and we're reviewing them, and it's it's good to look back because Celtic were really poor during a lot of the the, the period, and um, I'm going to bring this up because we're always into the new kits coming out, um, etc. And this, in actual fact, was um, when Celtic released. The jersey that you can see on the left-hand side, I don't know who these girls are who are being interviewed outside the park, but this is Goldust looking back, right? So Celtic, uh, whose kits at the time were being made by Umbro, released two fairly controversial jerseys. Mm -hmm. And this was um, in the first season under Liam Brady. So the home one was controversial and it had a red, white and blue sponsor. Yeah. And then the away one was, at the time, pretty radical in, in its design with quite a lot of colour and a zigzag kind of design on it. So the Celtic collection, which was the VHS uh, collection back then, decided in all their wisdom to go out and interview fans outside the stadium and ask them what they felt about their jerseys. So what I want to find out is, is anybody out there on this video? For the for, That's the first thing, because that would be pretty hilarious if they were. Um, but also check out the reaction of these fans. I'm going to play this in just a second. Check out the fans' reaction to the, the jersey on the left. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's, it's dead different and all that. It just doesn't look like Celtic at all. Just like the colours, nice change. It's a wee bit like a new Scotland strip as well with a design it. It's not the boys without the... It's not the boys without the hoops. No, sorry. I look at in the paper, it wasn't very nice, but you see it close up, it's nice. Ah, it's quite smart. Oh, I never liked it at first no. when I seen Bobby Murdoch wearing it, but that's no surprise with him wearing it. No, that's quite smart. Right. Well, it's a bit radical, but I'll go with it. Well, it's quite good, and I like the way the triangle goes in it, and it's a good design. It's all right. <laughs> it's not bad. We're a bit old, you see, so old people find changes different. The young ones take to change good. Rubbish. I don't know, it sort of grows on you a bit. It was shocking when it first came, but I think it grows on you a wee bit. I think it's bogging. It's horrible. It's horrible. I think it's bogging, says the wee fellow on the left. I'd love somebody in that video uh, to raise their hand and tell us it's them, because uh, that is gold dust. And to be honest with you, the only thing I've got an issue with is the guy giving Bobby Murdoch a hard time. What was that no. all about? Um, I don't think he seems old enough to realise the brilliance of Bobby Murdoch. Um, the guy was an absolute genius. Many of the Lisbon Lions reckon he was the best player in that team. He was the talisman. But the reason I'm bringing that up, obviously, because there's been chat about new jerseys coming out. And as you say, the new training kit comes out today. And the club now, and it's part of the modern game, I guess, Everything becomes an event, Amy, and uh, you've got a release video for Training Kit, which came out today, um, and from our posts on social media, it didn't actually look like um, there was much positivity around uh, the Training Kit, but again, I, I've never been a big one on all that kind of stuff. The jerseys are what I'm interested in. What do you make of that video clip, Amy? Um, there's quite a few nice hairstyles, and obviously yeah. the jerseys themselves are quite radical, and do you think that away kit was indeed bogging? I'm bogging strong. I don't know. I quite like it now, but as you say, it's um, at the time it, it could have been seen. Obviously, I wasn't around. A bit radical, but every kind of like naff shirt that folk thought was naff at the time. Everyone, you know, twenty years later than now, you see them all kicking about. It's the same with like the Scotland shirts. You really saw that like last year during the Euros. You know, the mm -hmm. horrors. Um, and you know, like I've got like my dad's and my uncles, and they're like back in the day, it was terrible, and, and all of this. Um, and now you know, everyone's paying ridiculous prices just to have them because you want that something a little bit different. So it is, um, it's definitely one for the more acquired taste, I would say. It's definitely 
certainly out there. Um, but I don't know. I, it's a total sign of the signs because I... I agree with you. I'm not a biggest fan of like having the whole video like today. Like, and it's obvious, it's all just a marketing stunt now, isn't it? Um, but I have to say, I actually really like the training gear today. Um, I think they've really, really nailed that. I quite like that off green kind of colour. Um, I know it looks a little bit washed out, but um, <laughs> which I'm not really selling it then. I don't think I'd be getting into Celtics marketing too many times soon. Um, but I think it's uh, pretty decent. I think just the now with the badge, the way that it is on their waist strip, um, you know, with the, the crest around it, I just, I really like it and I think they've nailed it. I like the hood um, with the kind of like, not like a, a drawstring, more turtle neck. I think it's, it's really decent and you know, I don't think it'll top the the training gear from last year. I think that was exceptional. You know, the black and um, the clover. I thought that was just really spot on, and it's kind of infuriating. And I was actually thinking this earlier when I was checking out the the training gear that I think Adidas have probably done better in the training gear than the strips. Um, on the whole, like I love the away strip, I really, really do. But I'm just again so disappointed with how this home strips looking to be this season as I said last week I'm really really not impressed by it um, mm. and I just think yeah I think the training gear last year was, was spot on and what I've seen today I really like that kind of stuff as well so I think they've kind of hit the nail on the head there and I just don't think they've delivered yet especially on the home strips the away yeah but on the home just not yet the thing with that back, I'm going to be cynical and I think that people like the kit and then they look in the back of it, the way one I'm talking about, and they think, well, you know what, what we'll do is I'll just get my name and number on the back of it. So it's maybe even another way of topping up um, the actual payment from the fans. So if that's the case, that's not a good decision. However, you know how much we love jerseys. The first time I ever met JP Mason, he was wearing that radical away kit. Was he? Um, yeah, he came and visited us in Stirling. Um, for the first time that he was on a Celtic State of Mind way back in the day, but three or four years ago now, uh, and he was wearing that jersey, and it, it was a perfect fit, and it just it actually it looked great. It looked absolutely great, and um, it's just one of the ones again in time. It becomes iconic for yeah. either all the wrong reasons or all the right reasons, but iconic nonetheless. Um, now I've got a wee uh, point to bring up here. David Malarkey, section of the support, will never accept Taylor or Starfelt. Um, there is, you know, there's there's always going to be sections, I guess, within any football fan base who will struggle to accept certain players. And um, those two you've mentioned have certainly been the whipping boys. But I did see a kind of a change in attitude coming to the near, nearer the end of the season, particularly with Starfelt, who looks absolutely delighted to be in that photo shoot today, I've got to say. Um, big cheesy grin Starfelt had. But I think that... Um, a lot of Celtic fans were kind of turned around by the, the performances of Starfelt. And it would be difficult to say that uh, the performances of Taylor uh, would fail to do likewise because, you know, if you're playing well, you're going to turn around. All I would say is Tony Ralston's a prime example. Any player can turn the fan base around because I remember that even the, the very mention of Tony Ralston in the past was met with derision, um, but no longer is that the case. Um, I found it interesting, Amy, by the way, there is another video, but it isn't the video um, that dropped on social media yesterday on a otherwise uneventful Sunday afternoon comedian Ross Mains drops. I don't know what you would describe it as, but you've seen it, right? And um, it starts off with the intro to SpongeBob SquarePants. So thanks very much, Ross, for including me in the video because then my wee man obviously can share in my enjoyment and uh, also take the absolute piss out of me now that he's seen me on a, one of these episodes. But it was a Disney under the sea kind of parody, right? And uh, it was met with quite a lot of abuse, as you can imagine. Amy, have you seen it? I've not seen it. I've, I've wow. seen it. it was not on my phone at all wow. yesterday, last night. I've not seen anything. You are tempting me to play it, but that would be too cruel to anybody who's actually seen it. Um, I don't even know how to describe it. Is it uh, creative genius? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but anyway, Celtic Twitter went into meltdown. Um, and then, of course, people thought the guy was being like genuinely serious and putting it out. It's obviously tongue-in-cheek. Uh, he's bouncing about with a crab outfit and all that. It's, it's basically... It's a homage to Ange Postacoglu. Right, and with you. for anyone out there who's watched it, let me know your thoughts on it and the fact that they decided to throw in myself and Tony Haggerty into the mix as well, Amy. Oh, right. Um, 
yourself, you didn't appear, and I know you'll be feeling particularly jealous at that. Well, that's why I refuse to go and watch it now. I was, you had me, and, and now you've totally lost me again. Let me know what you think out there. Yeah, something did happen last night because Liam Gallagher was at hand, and I didn't go to see him. Um, I was chilling, as I say, yesterday, so I didn't. Uh, yeah, you're right. The Parker's team didn't go down well. But sometimes I think that people are putting things out for a reaction as well, Amy. So, you know... Right. He's a comedian, and I'm guessing that, you know, that video got him quite a lot of traction on social media yesterday. Just so, this is almost like, you know, preparing you for the event where your eyes start bleeding and you watch it. Ryan Taylor, horrendous video, says Ryan. And uh, let me know what else you think um, about that particular, yeah, Parkers, for God's sake. He, he did call that, but was it tongue-in-cheeks? Possibly, I'm, I'm, not sh I'm not too sure. It must have been. For me and Tony to make an appearance, it must have been tongue in cheek. I want to talk about the goalie situation. Of course, we've signed a goalie. He's come in. We've had um, lengthy discussions around whether Seagrest is the number two, the number three. He's definitely not the number one. There's only num one number one at Celtic Park at the moment. That could change throughout the season. Um, but I th found it interesting. That I read a story that um, Ross Duhan was wanted on loan by St Johnston Doncaster, mm -hmm. and I was convinced that he'd already been freed. So I had a look at the. Uh, this, the contract situation, and apparently his contract was uh, up on the 31st of May 2022. So I don't know if the two clubs are interested in buying him as a free agent or indeed he's still contracted at Celtic. That will become clear if and when he gets his move. He's a 24-year-old goalkeeper though, Amy, um, who's had several loan deals out at Air Tranmere, Ross County, Dundee United, Cumbernauld, Colts and Morton, most notably with Tranmere who I think uh, he, he performed particularly well with. He's played 122 senior games, none for Celtic. It's um, obviously time for this player, whether or not he's contracted at Celtic, it's time for him to find a club. And uh, at 24 years of age, he's far too old to, to bring back into the fold at Celtic. I mean, we've, we've still got Connor Hazard on the books. He's out on loan as well. So And, and Barkas is still on the books, he's out on loan. So, I mean, a, a player like Doohan, if it was going to happen... It would have happened before the age of 24, I would have thought. God, yeah. Um, I think just for, for everyone's sake, it's just, you know, you have those players that every year you just kind of need to get off the books. And I think he's just one of them, obviously. If you're not being, like, disrespectful, but if you're not making, um, you know, even the bench and, and making any appearance for, for Celtic by 24, it's not going to happen um, all of a sudden now, especially when... You know, you've got Joe Hart as your number one. You've just brought in Benji Seagrist as well. And then you've still got Scott Bain floating around. And then you've sent Barkas out on loan. And Connor Hazard still on the books as well. It's just not really going to happen. And then that's without even men mentioning, sorry, the big project, big project of Louis um, which is, you know, Celtic are, are so keen to, to continue to pursue. So, um, yeah, there's just too many goalkeepers actually um, and I think he's just one to um, yeah move on and I think I agree with you that, that Tranmere's probably been where he's most settled I think you know Lewis Laird obviously is, is really decent with the loan stuff um, and anytime you know obviously with, with Tranmere as well he was down with, with Leo Connor and um, I just yeah he was seen to be well liked down there and I think you've just got to sometimes bite the bullet and just admit that, that the time is up and it's just not going to work out and you know 24 you've still got easily 10 12 years left as a goalkeeper mm -hmm. um and i think you just go and try and pursue that anywhere that, that really wants you at this stage then yeah and if you find that fit you mentioned Tranmere that you know certain players just find a fit amy um and it, it just makes sense for them to go and, and uh, pursue that it, Guys like um, Ross do need to get games, and and you know that that's not going to happen at Celtic Park. Um, I've been bringing up some of the feedback about that particular video. I considered getting the Disney Channel after the new SpongeBob song PJD. Yeah, uh, so did I. Uh, someone's asking why was I not at LG? Well, I need to pick my my kind of events and my days out and all that very carefully because days off are few and far between, Amy. And uh, we're doing a lot of travelling at the minute with um, a state of mind, travelling about, doing interviews, going to festivals, etc. So, yeah, as much as I love Liam Gallagher, and I have seen him in all these guys, he's uh, front man with Oasis, BDI and Solo, um, I didn't go to that particular gig, but I've heard lots of good things about it. But on the subject of LG, and people might roll their eyes and think, why should we be speaking about Lee Griffiths? Um, 
I am going to speak about Lee Griffiths. I'm going to bring him up because um, yeah, I know, I know. I just seen LG and I thought he was talking about Griff. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the sorry tale of Lee Griffiths. This time last year, he was given a one-year deal by Celtic, Amy. Uh, much to the surprise of of many of the Axom contributors and, and those that comment on the show. But he was given a one-year deal, as was Tony Ralston. And you think to yourself, those two players, if you're looking at God-given talent, if you believe, in fact, that, that there is such a thing as God-given talent, um, the one who's got it, is Lee Griffiths. Tony Ralston, it appears, has had to work for every ounce of success that he's got and we love him um, getting that success and deserves every single part of it. But of the two of them, the one that's done well is the guy that's applied himself properly. He's had the professionalism and the attitude and he's kind of flown under the radar off the park and that's Tony Ralston. The other guy who scored over 100 goals for Celtic and he's part of an elite club in doing so, is falling off the face of the football earth, quite frankly. Um, and I remember, like, during the season when we offloaded him and it became clear that he was no longer going to play for Celtic, we we made comparisons, Amy, um, with Tony Stokes. Because these are two guys who are roughly the same age, um, who were big successes at both Hibs and Celtic. But their careers, for me, have been shortened by three, four, five years, I feel. And it's not down to a bad injury. It's not down to bad luck. It's not down to a loss of form. It's down to attitude, professionalism, fitness, off the field, shenanigans on both parts. And I read, interestingly enough, why am I talking about Lee Griff as well? You know, his last permanent club was Celtic. Um, was he permanent at Dundee? Was that a loan deal? He's like, I mean, he was given a contract this time last year at Celtic. Um, he's currently without a club, Amy. And he was talking about doing gym training, boxing training, six days a week. And there was a regret that he hadn't discovered this and applied himself in this way during pre-seasons before. And you're looking at that thinking, the guy's 32 in August and the penny has dropped now. Um, he's not sure if he'll get a club. He's hopeful that he does. And you look at him and Stokes and players like Riordan and O'Connor and even Paul Slane, who's back in the game, having been out away for six years. Yeah. And you think, imagine having some kind of ability as a manager to tap into the mindset of these players. And you can see them going off the rails before it happens. And being able to get them back on track and get the last two or three seasons out of them. Is it possible with Lee Griffiths? Is, right. that, is that person out there, does he exist? Or is it all down to the player? And if so, has he been given his final chance, do you think? Cy Ferry will take him up and goal and him and Paul Slane will be up top. Um, I don't know where Griffiths, the last place he played was Nitton Gallaudet. Um, he was in the winning team there. So, um, I, seriously? Seriously? Yeah, <laughs> I was in So what, what is the circumstances of that? So he's playing at a Gallaudet, <laughs> pot potentially going to get injured. Serious, at least. He's wow. taking that seriously. Um, I won that. Um, uh, obviously it did not work out at Falkirk he'll certainly not go in there um, I wouldn't I honestly I know I'm kind of joking but I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up at Open Goal Broom Hill I just think that's just so tailored for that kind of move um, you know I've got no problem saying it as well I think I've been really um, against the Colts in the Lowland League I think this Open Goal Broom Hill is a, a farce I really do As we're talking about PR stunts and, and marketing that's all this is um, and I think it's kind of just making a mockery of um, Scottish football, certainly the Lowland, the Lowland League in general. You know, the fact that Paul Slane's getting brought back in, drafted back in, which was, you know, the minute that the rumblings at Sci Ferry was taking over, everyone knew that that was going to happen. Um, and I just think that it was, yeah, written in the stars. And I, I really wouldn't be surprised if, if Griffiths goes there. I think that's probably where his level's at now. Um, because, you know, I actually, earlier on when you were saying that, you know, a God-given talent, I don't really always believe in that, but I think you're thinking as well, right? It has to be a God-given talent because look at the lack of training he's even admitting, the kind of stuff that he's, at 32 years of age, he was totally unknown to, you know, and he's been a top internationalist and he's been, you know, Celtic's top goal scorer, 40-odd goals a season um, and wasn't even kind of, like, accustomed to this sort of training. So... Um, I, yeah, I think it, it does have to be some sort of God-given talent with Griffiths, and you know, it's just you know, there's been a lot of with 
with it being um, no no football, obviously you get all the reruns like on Sky and whatnot. You know, like five one um, at Ibrox, and you know I just always think of that that strike at, at Ibrox from Griffiths. You know, um, the power strike past Fotheringham should probably really be doing a little bit better actually, but it's just the sheer power in that strike, and that's like he's he just done that from dead ball situations as well. Mm. And I don't think you can actually teach that. I think that just is literally you know, embedded. Um, and it is, it's such a waste, you know, the fact that he's only got, I don't know, what will he have, someone maybe like four Scotland goals if that, two against England. Um, and I can't actually even think of any other open open play goals, obviously. But then you're just, you know, you're touching even on the Scotland. He scored a penalty against Serbia um, just for Scotland, well, now 18 months ago, something like that. So it's not even that long ago that, you know, and then so only... 15 months ago, folk were wanting to go to the Euros because there's just that talent. And now, you know, we're talking about him probably playing in the fifth tier of Scottish football um, at, at best, really. Because it didn't work out at Falkirk. It was, again, something maybe like two goals, if that. Um, so nobody else in, is really going to pick him up at that stage, I don't think. Um, you know, and the Championship's not actually even that strongly this year, but it's League One that's really strong this year. Well, the Championship's just odd this year in, in Scottish football, but you're looking at League One. Um, you know, there's big, big clubs down there now. So I just don't see why any day, you know, you're not thinking that he's going to go and make a, a game at Dunfermline or anything like that, is he? Um, so I think, yeah, I would just not be surprised. I don't have any insight knowledge, I don't, but I really wouldn't be surprised if he ends up at Open Goal, Broomhill, whatever right. else it's called. It is interesting when you remind us of the fact that uh, people were talking about taking up at the Euros and like you say, he scores that um, penalty under intense pressure. Uh, and where is he now? Dermot Hill. For anyone who's not seen it, Dermot, um, the quote is, the video is bogging. That's what Dermot reckons. But I know, that Amy, that you're already searching for that video. I saw you oh, looking I at am. the phone. <laughs> you cannot wait to see it. Um yeah, it must have taken a long time for them, actually. Talking of strikers, though, um, one of the things I would like to to put out there is I think Celtic still need a striker. Um, now, I've had this discussion a couple of times. We've got two recognised in Kyogo and, and Yakamakis, of course. And people have continually reminded me that Abada can play there and, and Maeda can play there. Um, and I'm not so sure that, that we go into the new season with that um, as your backup. And we only need to go back to December. You know, prior to the uh, the January transfer window, where we were so short on strikers, Amy, that Joey Dawson came on against St Johnston. Big man did okay, um, but it wasn't ideal throwing an 18 year old in for his debut under those circumstances. Do you think we still need a striker, or is that way down on the priority list for Ange? No, I do think we we need another striker. I really do. Um, it's tricky. I know we were saying that last week as well. I don't. I don't know where we stand with it yet, because I do think there is a player in there, and I just—it's just one of those like annoying cases because I think you can see, you know, when you think of these past clubs, there has to be something, there has to be a, a player in there, and I, and I do believe that there is, um, but can Ange really get the best out of it? I think if anyone can, it, it will be Ange Postecoglou, but I do think even the the Yeti conundrum, I still think either way, I think. I would like another striker, and I really do. Um, there are other necessities, I would still say, across the park, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if Celtic are really trying to nail down at least at least one striker that's going to just come in and I don't know if you can get someone that can possibly challenge, you know, Yakamakis and Kyogo, and then, of course, Maeda as well, but I think another one would be, um, it certainly wouldn't go wrong, put it that way. I'd forgotten about a Yeti. What does that say for me? That speaks volumes, doesn't it? Um, I think that if we can't get a deal for a Yeti to go elsewhere, and if we do, the best I think that we're going to get is a loan deal like Barkas because there's so much going against the player at the moment. I mean, it's not as though he's coming off a good run of form. He's on high wages, as everybody knows. So you're probably looking for that one-year loan deal whereby he needs to go and prove himself so that the club can make it a permanent deal at the end of the 12 months. Um, if we can't fix that loan deal, I don't think we'll buy a striker. I think you know the club will just look at that and think, he's your backup. If you need a striker, he's the man. Um, now, 
Michael Ross agrees we do need one. Griff to join up with Lenny. That that's a, a lesson in never to burn your bridges, isn't it? Um, him Absolutely. and Lenny, and, and then before you know it, Lennon's got a job, and he's obviously looking at some of the players that might be available from Celtic. Um, and I don't think Did that Adam him. Did Adam I saw that last week actually. Yeah. yeah. Yep. He's. I've seen he's it rumoured. Did it go through? Yeah. So he signed for for Lenny's side over in Cyprus, who were supposedly all, also interested in a smile of sorrow. And um, it looks as though Partizan Belgrade joined the uh, hunt for sorrow. It looks as though he will be another of our uh, surplus to requirement players who will be on their way. I've got a list here, Ball and Golly, Ajeti, uh, Mikey Johnston could also be on that list. We've had that discussion time and time again and sorrow as well because I just feel that they're they're blocking the pathway either to someone coming through or someone being purchased because you know as a board they'll look at that and think why do we need why do we need another goalie? I mean that, that might be a, a question but we've brought in Seacrest. Why do we need another striker when you've got a jetty there on big wages? Um, there's also a few comments coming in in relation to um, here we go and I think you agree with this Amy. Open goal lads now at Broomhill is an embarrassment for Scottish football. I was looking at it. I did what I watched Slaney's interview. Um, oh, there's a documentary coming out on Wednesday yeah, as well. That'll be yeah. interesting. So there's a documentary coming along. And I mean, I don't know the inner workings of it. I'm just like everybody else watching that. But I do look at the fact that, right, so you've you've made a documentary about the recuperation, the fitness regime, the challenges I'm guessing that he's had in that three month period, which I think is how long it took. So the decision isn't a football decision entirely. That's the thing. That's the point I'd make. The decision is two pronged. It's a football decision, but it's a content decision. Let's get content out of it. Let's get a footballer into the club. And I think that when you're approaching it from that angle, we've no skin in the game. We're not competing with open goal or anybody else. We're certainly not going to set up a football team, Amy. Um, <laughs> but but if, if, if we bring back out of retirement. That's a good question. Right, before the end of the show, go. right, I'm going to tell you a few players. Um, I don't know uh, if Stokesy or Griff would be our front line, to be honest <laughs> with you. However, yeah. if the decision is not purely based on football, then it's a bad decision, I feel. Right, and, and I think that if you're doing it and it's a double-pronged one, you think, oh, you know, we can get some good content out of this. I'm not sure that's a good decision. All the best to Slaney. I watched the interview. He's the type of guy that you want to see succeed. You want to see him do well. He's an ex-Celtic player. We know that he's had troubles. For any footballer to stop playing at 24, I think is a travesty because it wasn't fully injuries that, that pushed him out of the game, Amy. Um, and, he's, and he's back and he's playing next season. So good luck to him. But I just think that when the decision's not 100% a football decision, you might come into some kind of problems later down the line. I just don't understand like the basis behind it then so what happens if you know it all goes to, it goes horribly wrong you know, <laughs> it all goes uh, yeah it, it goes horribly wrong right so if you sacked or then is that is that basically it do you not get sacked then because obviously Broomhill obviously were most folk know them as BSC Glasgow last year they changed to Broomhill and now it's open goal Broomhill but you're spot on with the um with the content and it's a tiny thing, but when you're involved in football in any kind of way, I just think that it's, you're even a football, do you know what, you just have an interest in football actually, but I know it maybe seems petty, but Sat um, Sai Ferry, Paul Slane was announced via the Open Goal Twitter, not the Open Goal Broomhill Twitter, and I think that just speaks volumes, you know, that is just all about, so that's just Open Goal, that's got nothing to do with the football inside the Broomhill. You know, and the followers are obviously all the open goal. So I understand that, you know, you're wanting to reach a bigger audience, but you re you just quite simply, you know, you do it. You just quite simply retweet, retweet, sorry, the actual tweet. But it has, if it's a footballing matter, if you're signing a player, surely it has to be from the club account. That's maybe just, you know, somebody who's ran a club account and I just get really quite pernicky about these things. But that's just all about the brand open goal. You know, the badge looks horrendous. Um, and I have to say, I'm not a, a fan, and it's it's all about the brands. I think you know, there's comment coming in. It's about a franchise. It, it's not wrong, um, and yet it's you know, no other team really would be able to entice the kinds of players that Open Goal are. 
to to the Lowland League, and that's obviously you know the money's there as well, and whatever else will come with it. But it's all about this behind the way they sell it. You see, it's behind the scenes malarkey, and you know, and I'm all for that actually, and I like having to, a little bit something different. I think we've got to move with the times in, in football, and you know, that kind of stuff should be definitely available more often and I think players are, are themselves getting better with cameras getting chucked in front of them left right and centre but I think there's a, a line to toe really because at the end of the day you're still first and foremost should be a football club and the aim should be to win a game of football and um, mm-hmm. not get the most likes on this player announcement or, or something like that. I've got to say we had a discussion in here um, a long time ago now Remember that kind of expose behind the scenes, flying the wall thing they did with Hearts? Remember, and it wasn't that well received. Mm. I can't remember what it was called. Yes. And we were having a chat in here and we said, what club in Scottish football would it work with? And I remember Colin Watt, who gets a total slagging off of me for our Tony Ralston, uh, Luke O'Connell, Leo oh. Connor thing, right? But that's fine. It's all tongue in cheek. Uh, he's still not paid a £25 to the charity though. And we had the discussion and Colin Watt said... The club that he would follow as a fly in the wall documentary would be our broth because of the Dick Campbell. And this was about 18 months to two years ago. Yep. And had we taken Colin's advice, we would have had an absolute blockbuster documentary series right. on <laughs> YouTube by now. And Netflix All these Amazon been... ones that are doing it like Spurs and that's not, not got a, <laughs> a picking on this. They definitely do not. Um now, we're talking about who would we bring back for the, the Axom team. Robert Gibson, Tony's wardrobe is more famous than Narnia. We could probably use Tony's wardrobe, you know, in the the reveal videos, you know, when we're revealing the players that are coming out yeah, exactly. of that particular wardrobe with a smoke machine behind it. I've already started thinking about it. I don't know any players who would come out of retirement. I don't think we've got any former players in the team um, beyond uh, getting yeah. a game for the school, uh, <laughs> getting a game for the school. Um, yeah, any anybody at all that you want to suggest we should try and bring out of retirement for the the action. We do sponsor a team. You do know we sponsor the Celtic Old Boys team that go and do charity games uh, to raise money for local food banks. It's not been set back up since um, post-COVID, but I'm sure it will be eventually. And it's great to see the Axon logo and jerseys worn by the likes of Rudy Vata and Simon Donnelly, Tom Boy, Brian McClare, etc., etc. Um, I'd maybe get Big Rab Douglas to play in goals, actually. Imagine how much fun he would have been on the Arbroath documentary. I know, I know. I'd get I'd get Big Rab to play in goals uh, for our team, but that that is uh, another discussion for another day. Um, I've got in my notes here Yosuke Ideguchi. He's been speaking recently again, Amy, about some of the frustrations that he's had since he came to Scotland. Um, this is on the back of Rio Atati telling us that he, he wants to score more goals. That's going to be an improvement in his game next season. Uh, Dyson in Maeda saying that he's going to show us his true speed which is going to obviously fill the rest of Scottish football with fear. And I think that what we're getting a sense of is that these players that came in at some point during the season, rather than getting the full pre-season, under Ange, etc., um, I think what we're going to get is a version two of them next season, in season two. We're going to get an improved version of a lot of these players. But the one that seems to have been, maybe not forgotten about, but he's been put in the shade by... Um, his countryman is indeed Idiguchi. And there's a lot of talk about Celtic, you know, uh, being in for various defensive midfield players. He can play there, uh, regardless of whether or not that's his position in the future. Do you think this season uh, we're going to see a player in Idiguchi, one that we, we only saw very, you know, short flashes of last term? I'd certainly like to hope so. You know, I don't, there's nothing to suggest that Ange is the kind of guy who would bring someone in who's not going to make an impact yet, you know, because everyone has. Um, and I think, yeah, it's not any fault on, on his part. It's just that, you know, he's probably came in in one of the more solidified positions. Um, and it's, yeah, Maeda and, and Hitati who came in with have just absolutely stormed it. Um I do think there has to be a player in there because, like I say, he was the one that was kind of like the most established, really. Um, and there was certainly a lot of good talk about him beforehand. Um, you know, we keep going back to it, but Hitati was meant to be this utility player. Um, and so you're thinking, right, if that's a utility player, then how good is the, the, the guy who's meant to be coming in and, you know, is the most accomplished pretty much out, out of them? So 
I think they'll definitely be a part of play next season and you know it will be basically like a new sign in just due to his lack of appearances so far um but with all you know and I include Matt O'Reilly in that as well I think with a, a full pre-season under the belts and, and really getting to see like I think that's frightening you know if my does coming out and saying that you know next season you're going to get to see real speed um I don't know how much quicker one man can be but um it's certainly all um filling up with the the, the right kind of senses anyway wonder if Jim is in Tony's wardrobe Jim's not that's where he been as far as as far as I'm aware in Tony's wardrobe and uh, neither is Kevin Graham who's on holiday uh but I don't know if he told me or if he didn't but it's been kind of busy in here so I was expecting him on the show last Wednesday and he didn't turn up and he sent me a message from the poolside in Greece saying I'm on holiday mate that's why I'm not there um so he's definitely not in the wardrobe um and neither is Jim Jim's just having a well-deserved break after a, a series of spectacular gigs where he took Bend It Like Bertie on the road um, to 15 or 16 different venues. Massive undertaking for Jim. Uh, but he did it and he did it well. Um, I guess last season we were banging on about whether or not McCarthy would have that second birth, that rebirth at Celtic. And now we're, we're talking about Eddie Gucci. I think th there's more chance of Eddie Gucci getting it than, than James McCarthy, to be honest with you, Amy. But um, looking at his career, he's tried... Uh, he he tried to sample British football before and it didn't work out at Leeds United, um, and I, and I guess that will maybe be adding fuel to his fire as well. The fact that you know he doesn't want to try a second time for that not to work out um, either. Let's have a wee chat then about some of the other areas of the park. Um, centre half position I find an interesting one because currently we've got undoubtedly Carter Vickers and Starfelt um, as as the the partnership. As it were, we've signed Carter Vickers, which is tremendous. Really chuffed with that. Um, and behind them, I guess, you've got Chris Julian and Stephen Welsh. Now, apparently, although I've not seen any direct quotes, Julian wants to stay and fight. Would you be happy with him as backup, Amy? Julian? Um, if he wants to stay, you know, um, again... I think more than anything right now, it's is the comments for me still. I know some people think that I'm, I'm needing into them a little bit too much, but I just I didn't really like the the manner in which he came out and says what he said. So if there's an attitude that he wants to stay and fight, then I think if the player wants to be here, you know there is a player in there, and um, we were so excited about him coming back, and you know when he did get injured, it was it was a huge blow. Um, so it's, you're assuming that he's not just going to have totally lost it but if as long as the attitude's in the right place then I would say you know he's a perfectly suffice kind of backup even if he does stay I would still say that you know earlier on when you asked is, is a striker a priority and I said I think there are other areas I do think centre half still one of them mm -hmm. and that would have been you know if Carter Vickers signed or not or if Julian went or not because it only takes for the injury to one, you know, Julian doesn't have the, the greatest track record in an injury. Um, and, you know, Stephen Welsh, I, I, he, he's not done many things wrong, to be honest with you, but I do still think just another centre-half really wouldn't do it any harm whatsoever, just to maintain that high standard um, of, you know, a ball-playing centre-half kind of thing. Ideally, a left-footed one as well. Well, talking of left-footed centre-halves, uh, Liam Scales certainly fancied himself as a left centre-half. When he was asked the question in the press conference when he signed, he said that was his best position. Um, I don't think he got many opportunities, if any, to play there for Celtic. What do you make of his loan deal to Aberdeen? There is no option to buy. So it looks as though Celtic are, are trying to, to get him the game time that uh, benefited players such as Chris Ayer and, and Ryan Christie in the past, you know, loaning them out to, to teams in our division and getting them games. Well, I know that's right up your street, isn't it? Um, and that's what you would prefer out of, you know, any kind of circumstance. And you've got to agree. You think, right, if you can go to Aberdeen, play some kind of pivotal role against the sides that can, you know, that Celtic Grove is competing against week in, week out. And if that can kind of, in some weird way, aid Celtic to, towards the title, then, yeah, you know, you've got to try and take that chance. And you're playing at, a, at the, the level, sort of, that you'd be expected to play on week in, week out. We've seen it, like you say, with Chris Iyer at Kilmarnock and Ryan Christie as well. Obviously, had a really good time up at Aberdeen, both spells. So um, I'd much rather that instead of him going out, you know, to, to some European country where he can't affect the, the, um, the table, the league table, week in, week out. So... 
it also means he's a bit closer to home, you know, there's more chance of not even like us seeing him, but Celtic are getting to see him more. And I just think it can work out better for, for all parties. And if he's getting more familiarised to the league, the setup and everything that comes with it, you've got to hope that that can be the, the best possible move. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think so as well. And when you've got a player who isn't in the plans, and I think we've had six, seven, eight of those last season, get them out on loan. You know, if you can't get them tied up, just get them out on loan so they're playing. You don't want a player to stagnate. Will McMillan, picking up on the point we said earlier, expecting big things from uh, JJ, Kyogo and O'Reilly next season. Kyogo had stop start with injuries. O'Reilly came in late. JJ, about the same, came in after the season had kicked off. Amy was in and outside because of injury, etc. You want these players to hit the ground running after a full pre-season under Ange Postecoglou. Loads more to discuss. We haven't even spoken about Kyogo, uh, but that's us up to the one-hour period, Amy, and it was a fantastic hour, and I hope that everybody enjoyed it. Um, there's loads more coming from a Celtic State of Mind, so get onto the uh, YouTube Axom channel, and you will also find loads of music and culture on there, as well as other um Football style interviews. We spoke to Richard Jobson a few weeks back. That's going to be on the channel this week. Love the guy. He is unbelievable. We speak about St. Pauli, Celtic, music, poetry, film, the whole shebang, everything that we're passionate about. Um, and he was a great guy and he gave us loads of his time. All that's left for me to say thanks, everybody, for getting involved in the comments. Um, if you send us messages and we've not got back to you, we definitely will do. And thank you once again. Amy Canavan for joining me on a Celtic State of